I didn't solve the climate crisis. <laughs> Relax. In times of unimaginable grief, people will offer you their sympathies. And I appreciate the outstretched arm, but I've been in a breaking things kind of mood. I've been scarfing down enough food for thought that I've got bowels so backed up with brilliant ideas, eventually I'm going to ship books. Books so badass, they'll be banned for trying to define bravery as walking into a biker bar wearing a pink sweatshirt with a picture of a unicorn being tamed by a gnome. <laughs> Going it alone is like leaping out of a window waiting for someone to catch you. Be calm. I've gone from needing a shoulder to lean on to trying to call in the night and to thinking it has a day shift. Trained my shadow to shoplift light from the back pocket of levity, bent my forehead to the kiss of brevity, hoping I could get through depression with some semblance of speed. But the live camera feed is on a 24-hour delay, so I keep reliving the worst parts of yesterday in slow motion. And someone once told me that the finer points of devotion are about the size of a pinhole, but there's millions of them. And if you can connect to each dot, then you've got a diagram of what you think you thought you knew. And if you're willing to admit you know nothing, you've got a blueprint for a breakthrough. I spent the large part of a long while wondering when I was going to have a breakthrough and what kind of breakthrough that would be. What I realized is that to discover the thing you're brilliant at, you first have to endure realizing all the things you're average at. That can be a heartbreaking process. It hurts to discover that perhaps you're not as amazing at something as you thought you were or hoped you were. Turns out I am a shockingly below average Batman. <laughs> it's okay. I've come to terms with it. I accept that there are things that I will always want to do better. And it's that want that makes me try. And this isn't to say there haven't been hurdles. Growing up, I always wanted to be a better student, but ultimately, I spent more time surviving school than I did participating in it. See, my experience with problem solving was much different and more severe than trying to figure out who had how many apples left after giving away how many to whom. My problems went something like this. If the bus leaves school at 3.40 p.m., but Shane decides to walk home and is able to leave at 3.10 p.m. because he was smart enough to empty out his locker before the last class, Will the 30-minute head start give him enough time to get to the path behind the arena before the three boys he was hoping to avoid by taking the bus spot him and exit the bus early to follow him home and make his life miserable? Sometimes. Sometimes I could make it. Other times, I was not so lucky. The problem was there were too many variables, too many unforeseen circumstances that prevented me from making a clean escape every day from stoppages in the hallway by their students to teachers asking me to clean their blackboards. Precious seconds being eaten up by random obstacles. Turns out the solution to that problem was to find an empty classroom and stay there until all the buses had gone home. Suddenly the word stay in school took on new meaning in greater depth. <laughs> and it wasn't so bad. It gave me a chance to finish my schoolwork and I could walk home in relative peace. It also led to one of the greatest discoveries of my youth, the library. Growing up, the first friends I ever made were in the library. And here's an interesting fact about those friends. I've never met a single one, but they were there for me. Like doctors making house calls, doing their best to give me the right medicine at the right time. Henry David Thoreau wrote, the price of friendship is the total surrender of yourself. No lesser kindness, no ordinary attentions and offerings will buy it. There is forever that purchase to be made with that wealth which you possess, yet only once in a long while are you advertised of such a commodity. I made words my friends. In eighth grade, when my entire life looked more like an escape plan, it was Richard Adams and Watership Down that gave me hope. All the world will be your enemy, prince with a thousand enemies. And when they catch you, they will kill you. But first they must catch you. 
was that three-letter word, but. But first, they must catch you. It meant that in the face of a towering impossibility, there was still a chance. In fifth grade, when I was being called ugly more often than I was being called by my name, it was Marjorie Williams and the Velveteen Rabbit that taught me about beauty. Specifically, the scene where the skin horse talks to the rabbit about the process of becoming real. It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, your eyes drop out, you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all. Because once you are real, you can't be ugly. Except to people who don't understand. I wanted people to understand me. Be who you are and say what you feel. Because those who mind don't matter, and those who matter don't mind. Dr. Seuss. I had safe passage aboard that friendship, and I continue today making new friends. Leonard Cohen, Jeanette Winterson, Sherman Alexi. I've never met these people, but their words helped me to look at my own world differently. And in a subtle way, they let me know that there's a big bang happening inside of my head. An imagination exploding forever outward. I became a kind of map maker, charting ideas that sprouted up in the emptiness, like chains of islands growing into continents, new landscapes that needed exploring. I started creating my own worlds. I started writing. I kept little spiral bound notebooks, scrapbooks for. Silly ideas and horrible, untested pickup lines intended for girls I would never speak to. Example, written at age 12. You are the type of girl who would join band and take up an instrument like the theremin just so it wouldn't feel left out or lonely. I feel both left out and lonely. Perhaps you should take up me? Or, written at age 14, slightly less sophisticated, but perhaps a little smoother. You're so sweet, you could give cake diabetes. <laughs> None of this was brilliant. It was not beautiful poetry or gripping prose, but I loved doing it. I love to hope that someday I could say something like this to someone and have them understand that what it really means is I like them enough to risk embarrassing myself if it means there's even a chance that they'll smile. I wrote every day, nothing concrete, vague wonderings. Example, if life gives you lemons, find the person that life gave sugar to and form a team. Then find the person that life gave water to and be a gang. A sweet, refreshing gang. That's a 10th grade philosophy. But just when my thoughts and ideas were starting to come together and form structures, I stopped writing. Fear. Fear brought me back to my corporeal world. My grades started to drop, and I was scared. I was held hostage with the idea that if I didn't focus on my grades, I'd never get into a good school and thus never get the job I want. I fell into a deep depression, sick with worry, wondering what kind of life I'll have if I wait too long. They made it sound like if I didn't hurry up and plot my trajectory, then all the good lives would be taken and all I'd have left to choose from are the scraps. What I learned about depression is this. If you keep your eye on depression, then back away, spacing yourself farther and farther, but all the while watching depression shrink in the growing distance. When that tiny speck of sadness vanishes from sight completely, it's as if at that precise moment, your periphery will catch two hands reaching up from behind you to cover your eyes, and you will hear a small voice whisper, guess who? 
Depression can be a kind of loop. Depression can be a kind of loop. Depression can be a kind of loop playing over and over again. A lot of the times we tend to bookmark our pain so we can come back to it later, hoping it will hurt less with each reading. I started to wonder if this was my breakthrough. What if I'm only good at being depressed? What kind of job can I get with that? Head mailman in charge of delivering bad news? <laughs> Insomniac bed and pillow tester? This went on for years. I kept waiting for everything to level out. I kept waiting for my life to finally be normal. One day, at one of my lowest points, my grandmother came to me. I was raised by my grandmother. And she could see that I was struggling. And she came to me with a stack of books that I'd written in. And she said, oh, here are your diaries. <laughs> I said, those are journals. And as I started to go through the entries, I came across one almost blank page, a single sentence written in the top left-hand corner. All it said was, if your heart is broken, make art with the pieces. I couldn't believe that something I'd written turned out to be the right medicine at the right time. I kept reading. I was rediscovering myself. A lot of it was grim, but there was still a silliness to it. Example, today my teacher asked me, if everyone else jumped off a bridge, would you? <laughs> I said, no, <laughs> but secretly, I would. <laughs> but I would wait until everyone else had jumped off. That way there'd be a nice soft pile of dead bodies for me to land on. <laughs> and I could happily walk away. <laughs> Other parts were darker. I live like a magic lamp within a demon, like a genie who waits to grant wishes of violence when I am rubbed the wrong way. Difficult to acknowledge ever having felt that way, but nonetheless true. And comforting in a way to see it written there on the page as if I'd managed to capture some part of myself and hold it there long enough to trace around the edges of it and show myself that I hadn't just imagined it, that it was real. And maybe the reason I was so depressed was because I'd been ignoring the things that brought me joy. I started writing again. And it didn't suddenly change my life, not magically, not all at once. But it did give me an outlet. And what I realized is that sometimes the thing you're brilliant at is the same thing you already love to do. Of course, not all of these things are gonna have real world applications. No one's gonna hire me to sit around and write shitty pickup lines. <laughs> Tough to get that job in this economy. <laughs> but I started to put my thoughts and ideas into structures, poetry, short stories, screenplays. There was no guarantee that anything was ever gonna happen with my writing. I always quoted the odds of success over and over again. Warning, a career in writing will lead to constant rejection and poverty. But, but, I couldn't help but see the positive. Warning, continued dreaming may cause serious results. I grew up in a school that said, if I can't succeed in the system that's laid out for me, then my life will be unremarkable. I believed that. That's what I was taught. I was taught to believe in limitations, that I must color inside the lines, that I must connect the dots in numerical order, and that's fine if all you want is a picture of an octopus. But if you want a picture of an octopus that wears a human for a backpack so it can walk around on land and protest seafood restaurants, you're gonna have to go about things a little differently. What I really learned in school is nothing new. Education has to evolve. We live in a constantly changing world, and in that world, systems break because they are rigid and unbending. 
If we spend our lives trying to adjust to something broken, we break ourselves in the process. All I did was learn to make art with pieces. And in finding a way to make those pieces fit, I learned one very simple thing about myself. I'm happiest when I'm happy. And no matter what I choose to do, I have to leave room for the things that bring me joy. There has to be joy. To offset all of the cruelties we will encounter, there must be a reward for our endurance. We're gonna lose people. Friends and family. We're gonna fall in love with people who might not love us back. We're all gonna be really outstanding at not getting exactly what we want out of this life, and all of that is what's normal. The worst property of pain isn't that it hurts, it's that it's completely normal. We're supposed to feel it. We are meant to endure difficulty if for no other reason than it gives us a reference point that allows us to navigate towards something better. I spent so long waiting to make some enormous breakthrough that I didn't see what a big difference even the small ones can make. Stop. Stop waiting for your life to be normal. It already is. The hard times are part of it. And the only things that hold us back are the things we can't let go of. Look at an avalanche and see that we're at our most powerful when we let go. Look at a flower and see that we're at our most beautiful when we open up. We live in a world that likes to say, everything is gonna be all right. Well, here's a spoiler alert. It might not be. Not all the time. There will be bad days. Be calm. Loosen your grip, opening each palm slowly now. Let go. Be confident. Know that now is only a moment. And that if today is as bad as it gets, understand that by tomorrow, today will have ended. Be gracious. Accept each extended hand offered to pull you back from the somewhere you cannot escape. Be diligent. Scrape the gray sky clean. Realize every dark cloud is a smoke screen meant to blind us from the truth. And the truth is, whether we see them or not, the sun and moon are still there. And always there is light. Be forthright. Despite your instinct to say it's all right, I'm okay. Be honest. Say how you feel without fear or guilt, without remorse or complexity. Be lucid in your explanation. Be sterling in your repose. If you think for one second no one knows what you've been going through, be accepting of the fact that you are wrong, that the long drawn and heavy breaths of despair have at times been felt by everyone, that pain is part of the human condition and that alone makes you legion. We hungry underdogs, we risers with dawn, we dismissers of odds, we pressers of on. We will station ourselves to the calm, we will hold ourselves to the steady. Be ready, player one. Life is going to come you armed with hard times and tough choices. Your voice is your weapon, your thoughts ammunition. There are no free extra men. Be aware in the instant now passes, it exists now as then. So be a mirror reflecting yourself back, remembering the times when you thought all of this was too hard and that you'd never make it through. Remember the times you could have pressed quit, but you hit continue. Be forgiving. Living with the burden of anger is not living. Giving your focus to wrath will leave your entire self absent of what you need. Love and hate are beasts, and the one that grows is the one you feed. Be persistent. Be the weed growing through the cracks in the cement beautiful. Because it doesn't know it's not supposed to grow there. Be resolute. Declare what you accept as true in a way that envisions the resolve with which you accept it. If you are having a good day, be considerate. 
A simple smile could be the first aid kit that someone has been looking for. If you believe with absolute honesty that you're doing everything you can, do more. There will be bad days. Times when the world weighs on you for so long it leaves you looking for an easy way out. There will be moments when the drought of joy seems unending. Instances spent pretending that everything is alright when it so clearly is not. Check your blind spot. See that love is still there. Every nightmare has a beginning, but every bad day has an end. Ignore what others have called you. I'm calling you friend. Everyone knows pain. But we are not meant to carry it forever. We were never meant to hold it so closely. So be certain in the belief that what pain belongs to now will belong soon to then. That when someone asks you, how is your day? Realize that for some of us, it's the only way we know how to say, be calm. Loosen your grip, opening each palm slowly now. Let go. Short story long. Thank you guys.